Good morning, everybody. Uh, interesting uh, thing you were song and praying that God would teach you. And what I'm talking about today, <clears throat> how does God teach us? In case you hadn't guessed, that's what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> Something interesting happened. Uh, Oh, it's been probably a year ago now. I was reading through uh, a Greek textbook. I've been studying Greek for several years. Uh, not that I'm a Greek scholar by any means. I'm just learning just so I can understand uh, some of the translation and things. But it was an interesting statement made in the, in the textbook. Uh, it was talking about a technical point in the Greek language but he was talking about abstract words. And uh, I looked up the word abstract just to make sure I had a clear uh, understanding of what he was talking about. And according to Webster's Dictionary, it's something that's difficult to understand, or it's not real clear, or it's insufficiently factual to really base anything on. It's an abstract idea. So, what really struck me about it was the word that he used to illustrate what an abstract noun was. The word that he used was truth. Now, turn over to John chapter 17, because this is the first thing I thought of when I, when I read that, and this has always been my concept of truth. Uh, Micah mentioned that he was 26 and uh, I'm 71 if that's really interesting to anybody I won't mind saying that but I was actually two years older than Micah is right now when God called me into his church so uh, Micah's just a kid to me <laughs> uh, everybody's young to me anymore uh, but like I said John 17 and verse 17 says something about truth that uh, kind of, to me, it contradicted the idea of it being an abstract noun. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. My definition of truth for a long time has always been God's word. Uh, so... It kind of threw me off when, when he said that this was an abstract idea. But if you turn over just one or two pages in your Bible to chapter 18 and verse 37, I can see where the writer was coming from. <clears throat> Pilate's being interviewed by, or Jesus is being interviewed by Pilate. Head it the other way around there. <clears throat> Pilate answered Jesus, uh, let me see, yeah, in verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I'm a king, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And here's what Pilate said to him, verse 38, Pilate said to him, What is truth? Truth is something I don't understand. It's an abstract idea. It's always been abstract to those that God doesn't reveal the truth to. Today I'd like for us to look at God's Word as being truth and see if we can determine if in fact it's an abstract idea or a concrete foundation for our faith. Turn over to Psalm chapter 119. Of course, if you're familiar with the psalm, you know that 119's got 172 verses, and each one of them talks about God's Word. Every single verse mentions a statute, a law, uh, or some way talks about God's Word. But I'm going to uh, just go to one verse, verse 105, Psalm 119 and 105. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
I thought of this when uh, Michael was talking about uh, sometimes get a, a little thing or sometimes the overall picture from one verse. This verse, to me, almost does that. I hadn't thought about it until he mentioned it today. It says, Your word, talking about God's word, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Is there a difference between a lamp and a light? Uh, I'm going to cover that in a couple of other verses that there, I think there is. And to illustrate it, uh, I wasn't going to talk about it until later, but I can remember when I was in the uh, Boy Scouts as a teenager, we'd go camping, we'd get out at night, and uh, we were supposed to stay in the general area, but some of us would always wander off uh, at night. If you weren't careful, you could fall over things in the dark. I remember we were camped next to a uh, farm one time, and some of the guys crossed the fence and were walking along, and they stumbled over a huge hog, and uh, he almost tore them up before they could get away from him and get back over the fence. But when I look at the lamp and the light, uh, the word lamp there is translated from the Hebrew word Nera, it's Strong's number 5216 if you're interested in that. But it means a candle, a light, or a lamp. And it's more or less like a, if I could throw out something that I would look at today as being that, it would be a flashlight. Because some of us carried our flashlights back then in the scouts. And when we were walking along, we would have seen that hog and wouldn't have fallen over it. Uh, it shows you where you can take your next step. A, light, a lamp does. The word light there where it says a light for my path is from a different Hebrew word. It's Strong's number 216. The word is or in Hebrew. And it can be something bright, clear. It could be the day. It can be light. It can be lightning. There's several different definitions for it. But it's the word that in the Bible, throughout the Bible, is used, or throughout the Old Testament, should say, used to distinguish between light and darkness. It's not a, a lamp, but it's light, like we have now. <clears throat> See all those guys riding by on motorcycles? I wish I was with them sometime. Right? There's a, looks like there may be a hundred of them because they're, we're going to hear this noise for a while because they're coming off the interstate over there, and I can see the, the back end of it. Uh, but we won't pay attention to them. But it's the word, like I said, in Genesis where God said, let there be light. And then a little bit later there in Genesis, it talks about creating the great lights to rule the day and the night. That's another word, and it's opposed to the small light like we were talking about, the lamp. And it's not light as in day and night, but it's the big lights like the sun, the moon, and the stars. There's three different words used throughout the Bible. I'm focusing on, in this verse, just on the one that means a little light or daylight or light as opposed to darkness. So your word is a lamp for my feet. From the Bible, it tells us our next step. Sometimes we wonder, is this the right thing to do? Is this a, uh, a sin? Well, if we look in the word, we can find, yes, this is a sin or it's not. So we know how to take our next step. So that's what the small light is. Where it's a lamp for our path, the light shows us the road ahead of us. Shows us we don't always see everything that's in the road ahead of us because we're limited there by our sight. There may be a curve and we can't see what's around that curve. But during the day, during the light, we can see the path ahead of us. We don't have to have something to tell us where to take our next step. It's to guide us. So the Word of God is both a lamp and a light. I was reading a couple of years ago in the book of Proverbs. Turn over there to Proverbs chapter 6. <clears throat> it's amazing. I'd read this probably, I don't know how many times, because I, I know I've read it many times before. But one day when I read it, it said, hey, wait a minute. This says the same thing that 119.105 says over in Psalms. In Proverbs chapter 6 and in verse 23, it's very interesting. Verse 23 of Proverbs 6 says, 
For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Now the commandment and the law are both found in the book. So God's word is both. But here it says there may be something different. The commandment is a lamp. If we get real specific and this is... Uh, trying to just identify those two different words, lamp and light, and the way they're used. Again, the commandment shows us our next step. Yes, you do this, you don't do that. So it's just like the, the, the lamp. The law, God's law of love, of course it's expressed in two expressions, love God and love your fellow man, but it shows us light. It shows us the whole path we'll follow. So we have the light and the lamp again, just like we did in, over in Psalms. So God's Word is a lamp and it's also a light for us. Let's turn over to 2 Timothy 3.16. I don't think any scripture about the book or about scriptures would be complete without going to 2 Timothy 3.16. Some of you may know it by heart and uh, may already be quoting it. It's one of the, probably the most familiar scriptures to us. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. If it's profitable for doctrine, I don't think it's an abstract idea. I think it's something we can sink our teeth into, something solid. For reproof, which can also mean uh, evidence, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture, far from being an abstract idea, is good for doctrine, reproof, correction. And before I, I better make one thing clear. Uh, when I this is the New King James Version of the Bible. When I hold it up and call it God's Word and the Truth. In uh, the world today, we have many translations. Uh, I've spent, since I got into the Greek, I really got into the translation thing. and I've spent more time studying the translations and translation theory than I have learning the actual Greek language. Some of the translations that we have today, I cannot hold up and say this is the Word of God. I, I, I just can't with a clear conscience because I know the difference in some of them. Uh, there's one translation that uh, uses the word, translates the, the phrase first day of the week as Sunday. Now I don't have any objection with that. They've done it eight times in there and that phrase is used eight times and I know that the first day of the week is Sunday. So I don't have any problem with that. The problem I have with that translation is it never uses the word Sabbath. Not once, from Genesis to Revelation. I call it the Sunday 8, Sabbath 0 translation, and, and I don't use it. Uh, I fear that there's just too much to lose if we don't identify the day of worship, which is what that translation calls the Sabbath. If we don't call it the Sabbath, I'm afraid there's too much chance of losing that uh, feel for the Sabbath if we use that translation. And that particular translation, I'll go ahead and tell you which one it is, it's called God's Word. That's the name of the translation. And like I said, I don't consider it that because it refuses to use it. That's not the only thing I have against that. That's the major thing. Actually, that's not even the major thing I have against it. I, uh, there's other things I don't have it. The problem with all the translations right now, and you have to read some of the uh, books on it or uh, articles on it to really get a grasp of it, but when you see the people who are writing about it, you realize the sad shape that this world is in. One of the most prolific writers promoting uh, doing away with the King James and the New King James, and some of them do. These books are not worth having. And promoting the newer translations, one of the men who's a leader in that in the United States, 
is the chair of the religion department at the University of North Carolina. Now, you think of the chair of a religious department at a university. Uh, he claims to be a Christian. But of God's word, of the Bible, he says this. It's a man's book. It was not inspired by God. And directly refutes what Scripture says there in Second Timothy. So this world, uh, sometimes I may say some things today about this world's theology, uh, is not based on Scripture. It's based on men's ideas. I'm not going to go off on all the translations and everything. That's not my purpose to tell you which translation to use. I just want to point out that there are different ones, and some of them are better than others. I'll put it that way. I won't get any more technical about it. Let's just look at the inspiration of Scripture. Can we prove, since he said that the Bible isn't inspired, can we prove that it is? Do we, do we think that it is? Turn over to John chapter 16. Jesus was teaching his disciples. He said something very interesting here in John chapter 16, talking about inspiration in a way. He knew that his disciples were going to be writing the Gospels. They were the witnesses he chose to write his words and send them on to man. And in John chapter 16, verse 13, he made a very interesting statement. However, when it, the Holy Spirit, of, or the Spirit of truth, has come, it will guide you into all truth, for it will not speak of its own authority, but whatever it hears, it will speak, and it will tell you things to come. It will glorify me, for it will take of what is mine and declare it to you. He told the apostles the Holy Spirit was going to be there to guide them as they wrote the Gospels, as they wrote the, the New Testament. Just a couple of chapters before that, in, in uh, John chapter 14, he said something very similar. John chapter 14 and verse 26. Let's we'll start in verse 25. It says, These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So he told them, when you're writing the Gospels, the Holy Spirit will come to you, bring these things to your remembrance. He was telling them they would be inspired. Let's see what Paul had to say about it over in 1 Corinthians, because he talked about inspiration. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're starting verse 13. Speaking again of inspiration, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13. Paul's talking, he says, These things we also speak, not in words which <clears throat> man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Paul said that they spoke what was taught by the Holy Spirit. They wrote what was taught by the Holy Spirit. Go over to Second Peter. Peter was talking about inspiration. Second Peter chapter one. And remember we're we're talking about inspiration here, so Second Peter chapter one, and we'll start in verse nineteen. Second Peter one, verse nineteen. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to, <clears throat> to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
We have Jesus' word that the Holy Spirit would leave. We have Paul's confirmation of it. And here we have Peter saying the same thing. The Holy Spirit inspired the word of God. And one of the big discussions in the uh, theological world these days is did God just tell these guys, write, write the general story, or did just an idea, or did he actually give them some words? Now, sometimes he didn't give the exact words, but I'm going to show you some examples of where he was very specific talking about words. This is called verbal inspiration, that he actually inspired the very words that were written down. Before we get into that, let's stop in Malachi, because most of this is back in the Old Testament, but let's stop in Malachi as we're going back and see something about God. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. This is uh, one of the scriptures that we have to base our faith on. Uh, that's very fundamental, and I don't think there's any way you can call it an abstract idea of what God says here. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. I don't think God's abstract. He's solid. That's something that we can build on. He doesn't change. He's the same. Uh, well, we'll read about Christ a little bit later. We, we won't go to, to Hebrews yet. Just know that God doesn't change. He's not abstract. He is concrete. Well, how about His Word? Is it any less concrete? Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 40. Say something about the Word. Isaiah 40 and verse 8. We saw in Malachi there that God doesn't change. In Isaiah 40 verse 8, the grass wither, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of our God stands forever. It's just like God. It doesn't change. It stands forever. Turn over to Isaiah while we're there to chapter 55. Isaiah 55, and we'll just read one verse in there, verse 11. You know, God doesn't change. His Word doesn't change. And we can depend on it. It's concrete. It is not abstract. In Isaiah 55, verse 11, So shall my Word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. God assures us that his word will not return to him void, but it will do whatever he intends it to do here. He created, he spoke things into creation, and he maintains this world by his word. And what he intends his word to do, it will be accomplished. So again... I say it's not an abstract idea. Let's go back to Psalm, see a couple of other things about God's Word. Over in Psalm chapter 12. A lot of this is just foundation for talking about the particular words, but I want to just make sure we understand overall the Word first. Psalm chapter 12 verse 6 Psalms 12 verse 6 says the words of the Lord are pure words like silver tried in a furnace purified seven times so God's words are pure words I was talking about the theologians of this world there's a big debate in theological circles about the preservation of the word that's the reason we have that's one reason that started the whole proliferation of newer translations uh, it actually started about 140 years ago but some scholars decided that God had not provide, preserved his word through the text that was used for the King James and uh, they brought along another text and most of the translations 
since that time have been made from the different texts. Their whole idea is that God didn't preserve his word from the time of the apostles up until they came up with this new text. Uh, it was lost for all that time. I get real skeptical when somebody says that truth is lost for, and it's been revealed through me. Uh, we've seen that in the church over the years, uh, and some people still teach that, that it's been lost, and I'm, your, I, I'm the one you should listen to because so, I've got the truth. God's word hasn't been changed. Here in verse 7 of Psalm 12, it says, You shall keep them, O Lord, you shall preserve them from this generation forever. What the theologians who say that the scriptures were lost for those 1,500 years, or actually a little longer than that, they said that verse 7 actually refers back to verse 5. It doesn't refer to verse 6, talking about God preserving his word. It talks about him preserving the people who were oppressed and the poor up in verse 5. Uh, it's a leap for me to to say that it doesn't just follow verse 6 the way it does there in, in the order. So God's words are pure, and he promised to res preserve them for us. Turn over to uh, Psalm 18 while we're here in Psalms, not too far over to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verse 30. Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. Uh, the King James, this is the New King James. The King James says the word of the Lord is tried. It's been tried and it's it's proven, brethren. He is a shield to all who trust in him. I'm just trying to hammer home the fact that God's word is pure. He's preserved it for us. Let's go over to Proverbs, the next book here after Psalms. Proverbs chapter 30. And we're still on this purity and preserving the word. Proverbs 30, chapter, uh, verse, yeah, verse 5, not chapter 5. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield to those who put their trust in him, might add, in his word. There's a warning given in verse 6. I want you to remember this because we're going to talk about it a little bit later. But verse 6 says, Do not add to his words. There's a warning given there. Or at least it says don't do it. There's no warning given there. There's a warning given later and we'll talk about it then. But God warns against adding to his words. So let's go back to Exodus and let's see if God actually inspired words. Or if he just gave ideas and abstract thoughts to people. Exodus chapter 4. Moses and Aaron are talking to the children of Israel. Or they're getting ready to. They're getting ready to go to uh, Pharaoh. And in verse 30, or uh, verse 29 of Exodus 4, 29. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Now, it doesn't say that in general he told the people what Moses had said. It says he spoke all the words. And I think we need to heed when it gets specific and talks about specific words. Over while we're here in Exodus, let's go over to chapter 24. Exodus 24 and verses 3 and 4. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 3. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. Verse 4, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Uh, there's a big dig going on over, in, I guess it's in Israel, and they've found some uh, ancient writings. The theologians who govern most of the uh, 
theological thought in the world right now. It's funny, Jesus had most of his problem with the Pharisees and Sadducees, the theologians of his time. And I think that's who we have our biggest problems with. Because the theologians today say, well, we're not sure there was a Hebrew alphabet back then, so we're not sure that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. There's a big controversy going on about that. Well, Exodus 24, 4 says, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Over in Numbers, a couple of books over, almost the same things repeated, but I just want to write it, uh, say it for emphasis. Numbers chapter 33, Numbers 33, verse 2. Now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the commands of the Lord. Uh, I can see why a theologian would say this book's not inspired because I don't believe Moses had an alphabet so he couldn't write so these places where it says he wrote, he didn't really write it. Uh, I can see with man's concept of abstractness how they see these things that way. Turn over to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is not exactly, but it's basically a summary of actually the first, or well, the previous three books, Exodus through Numbers. Deuteronomy 3, 31, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 31, verse 9. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to all the elders of Israel. Three different times there we read where Moses wrote. Now, I think when it said earlier, Aaron said all the words that Moses got from God, he talked about specific words. And Moses did write these words. That's what we have there. Let's look at some other examples of people getting words from God over in the Jeremiah. See what the prophet Jeremiah said about the words he used. Jeremiah, uh, we'll go to the first chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 9. I'm going to give everybody time to get there. I'm going to... Uh, been not told that I move too fast sometimes and I don't give you enough time so I want to make sure everybody gets to it. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said to me Behold I have put my words in your mouth. Jeremiah was either a prophet sent by God, or he was a liar. Uh, a lot of the uh, theologians who say that the words of the Bible weren't inspired refute what the prophet himself said, that God actually put the words in his mouth. Let's go over to Ezekiel, another prophet. Ezekiel chapter 2. See what Ezekiel had to say. Aaron claimed to speak the words that God had given Moses. Moses wrote that he wrote those words. Jeremiah said that God put his words in his mouth. Let's see what Ezekiel says in chapter 2. Ezekiel 2, verse 7. Ezekiel 2, 7 says, You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they're rebellious. He told him, he said, it's not up to you to make them believe this. Just speak my words to them. That's what he said. You shall speak my words. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Eat the words that I give you and speak my words. God gave specific words to the prophets. Go back to the New Testament and see what Jesus had to say about words. 
go over to John chapter 6. Jesus had a lot to say, and I can't cover all the verses where he talked about his own words, but in John chapter 6 and verse 60, Jesus is talking about the word, his words. John chapter 6 and verse 60. And I go to chapter 7. John 6, 60. He had just gotten through introducing an idea to his disciples that was totally new to them, totally foreign. He talked about drinking his blood and eating his flesh. And some of his disciples were kind of confused. Verse 60 says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? I don't understand what he's saying. Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, and he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Jesus said the words that he spoke are life. He emphasized words. Turn over to Matthew. Those of you who were here last week uh, know that I used this verse last week, but I want to go back to it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Back in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, in other words, those who hear his words, and does them, will liken, <clears throat> I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then down in verse 26, he says, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. So it's not just enough to hear what God says. We have to do it. Jesus added a little bit to it, but he did emphasize the hearing part also. Both instances there, one built his house on a solid uh, foundation, one built his house by hearing but not doing on the sand. Both of them had storms and rain. The one house stood, the other one fell. If we build our house on the firm foundation, if we hear what Jesus said and do it, we'll have a solid foundation for our faith. If we don't, we won't have that solid foundation. And we're talking about, I mentioned earlier in Malachi. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 13. Remember back there in Malachi, we read that God doesn't change. Hebrews chapter 13 says something about Jesus. So whether we're talking about God's word or Jesus' word, we're the same here. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, another memory verse that some of you have memorized. Hebrews 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God says, I don't change. Does that mean the same thing? The same yesterday, today, and forever does not change. That's the way the Father and the Son are. Turn over to John chapter 10. Sometimes people have a little bit of trouble understanding this verse. John 10, and we'll just read verse 30. But we read that God doesn't change. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. He didn't mean I and my Father are one person and one being. He meant they're the same spirit-wise. They're the same attitude. If um, they're one, Christ prayed the night that we would be one as He and the Father are one. It's of one mind. It's not one being, but they're the same. They're both eternal, and they do not change. Talking about Jesus' words, we read that God's words would not pass away. In Matthew 24, 
turn over there. We won't turn to all three of these scriptures, but there's three scriptures that say basically the same thing. They're all the same. You know, Matthew 24, verse 35. The four Gospels don't always record the same incident in all four, but this one is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's the parable of the fig tree. And Jesus talks about the fig tree giving its leaves and talks about uh, it being a warning of the end time, but we should see things happening and recognize the things from the parable of the fig tree. But down in verse 35, he makes a statement, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. That exact line is written there in Matthew 24, 35, it's written in Mark 13, 31, and it's written in Luke 21, 33. Three different times it's recorded for us. So when something that I've always been taught since every last 40 years at least, since I've been in the church, if something's repeated twice, you better pay attention to it. Well, this is repeated three times. Christ said, my words will by no means pass away. So I don't think I have to worry about it not being able to find God's Word. I have His Word on it, and I have Jesus Christ's Word on it. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians. Think about God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the way the Apostle Paul looked at the word. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcome it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Paul made a pretty bold statement there when he said his words were the word of God. So Paul claimed that what he spoke came from God. So we see that the Old Testament prophets made that claim that their words were from God and Paul said that his words were from God. Remember back in Proverbs 30 verse 6 it says, do not add to my words and I told you remember that thought. It's not just found there in Proverbs. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 4 when people start adding to and taking away from God's Word, uh, it's a very dangerous position to put themselves in. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Men have a bad habit of adding to and taking away from God's Word. But Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2 Moses said, You shall not add to the words which I command you, nor take from it, that you keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And then the same thought over in Deuteronomy chapter 12, just a few pages over. Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. Moses said, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Hammering this point home to us, Moses was strong about it. It was mentioned there in Proverbs. Let's turn over to Revelation right at the end. Chapter 22, the last book, or the last verse, the last chapter of the last book. Get tongue-tied here. Revelation 22, verse 18. We see that we're not to add to God's Word. We're told that three different times that we've read already. But there's a real warning given here in Revelation to add to that. Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. I don't want the plagues of Revelation added to me, so I don't, do not want to add to God's Word. 
Verse 19 says, And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. Uh, some of the translations say from the tree of life. Both, I think, either one would be satisfactory there. I don't want my name taken out of the book of life. So I'm going to do my best not to take away from God's word. Also, it says to take away his part from the holy city. We heard a little bit in the sermon ed about eternal life. I don't want to miss out on the, the holy city. From the things which are written in this book, talking about the entire story, the entire eternity. I don't want to miss out on eternity because I took away from part of God's book. I want to hear it. I want to speak it. Uh, hadn't thought about the verse, but it just popped in my head there when I said speak it. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, we won't turn over there. Um, maybe we better turn and make sure I read it right. Jeremiah 23. Uh, I'm doing this strictly out of memory, so I hope I'm in the right chapter. Yeah. Jeremiah 23 and verse 28. Give everybody time to get to it. Jeremiah 23, verse 28. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word. Let him speak my word faithfully. If you have God's word, He expects you to speak it faithfully. So we saw the warnings against those who didn't speak it faithfully. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter three. Uh, I think we did that in a sermonette. Uh, kind of when he first—I don't remember—he uh, read one of the verses earlier that I'm going to read. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'm just going to read verse 14. Uh, I was reading this particular chapter in my morning Bible reading that I do. Uh, it came up as the, the verse or the, the book for the chapter for today. In verse 14 of Ecclesiastes 3, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. It doesn't particularly talk about God's word there, but it says everything God does, we shouldn't try to add to it or take away from it. And the, the purpose there in, in the last line says that men should fear before him. Now, uh, I could give two or three sermons, or you could hear two or three sermons on the proper fear of God. Uh, the best, most of them say it's respect or reverence. It's not talking about cowering in fear. We, we know that. The best explanation I've heard of the fear of God is stand in awe of God. Just realize how awesome He is. That's the, the best definition of the fear of God that I've been able to come up with. And realize that nothing can be added or taken away from, and definitely nothing should be taken away from or added to His Word. We've seen that God's Word is inspired, it's pure. He promised to preserve it for us. Like the Father and Jesus Christ, it won't change. It's something we can sink our teeth into. And it's going to accomplish what God intends for it to accomplish. Let's just look at a couple other things about God's Word other than the fact that being inspired and being His Word. In Hebrews chapter 4. This is one of the often quoted verses talking about God's Word. Hebrews chapter 4. And again, it doesn't talk about inspiration or it just talks about the power of God's Word. Hebrews chapter 4. And we'll read verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12. 
For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's living and powerful. It's not dead. It hasn't passed away. It's living and powerful. Not too far from Hebrews is James, just a couple of pages over. Hebrews, we'll go over to James chapter 1, so it should be three or four pages over in your Bible. James chapter 1, we're still talking about the Word. Verse 22 emphasizes what Jesus said earlier about hearing the Word is not enough. James says here in chapter, verse 22 of chapter 1, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, walking off and forgetting about what he, what he saw. The more I look in the mirror lately, the more I realize I'm not a young man anymore. And I, it, it's hard to forget that. So I, I have trouble relating to that sometimes because I, I, I have trouble forgetting what I saw in the mirror this morning. But it, it just shows that we need to not only hear the Word, but we need to be doers of it. There's a little jingle or a phrase, uh, slogan. It's been going around for several years. I've seen it on bumper stickers. I've seen it on church signs out in front of the churches on their marquees. Uh, and you've probably seen it too. It says, Jesus said it. I believe it, that settles it. And I used to think, yeah, that's a pretty good little saying. You know, Jesus said it, I believe it, that settles it. I heard a man talking about it one day, and I realized from some of the things he said that the second line of that little phrase, I believe it, is only half true as far as the rest of the, the phrase. Jesus said it, that settles it. Whether I believe it, whether you believe it, whether Joe out there on the sidewalk believes it or not, if Jesus said it, that settles it. So our part, the believing part, is not really the doing it. That's the part that we need to do. Brethren, we've seen that God's Word is truth. It's not an abstract idea that some man comes up with. It's as solid as a rock. We can, with confidence, build our house of faith on God's Word, and it will stand the storms of life. 